so we're going to speak tonight about the cross in my life. First of all, I have been pointing out in previous sessions two very important facts about the cross. First of all, it's the basis of God's total provision for every believer. Everything we ever need in time or eternity, in every department of our lives, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, financial, temporal or eternal, has been provided for us through the cross. There is no other basis. Either we receive on the basis of the cross or we do not receive. Paul said, he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Just try to absorb those closing words. God will also, with Jesus, freely give us all things, but without him, nothing. On the basis of the cross, we can receive everything but without that basis, we are not entitled to anything. Secondly, and this is also very important, the cross is the basis of Christ's total defeat of Satan. Through his death, his substitutionary sacrifice, his victorious resurrection and his triumphant ascension, Jesus has administered to Satan and his kingdom one total permanent, irrevocable defeat. There is nothing Satan can ever do to change that fact. And it's on that basis that we have victory over Satan. If we come in contact with Satan, if we have a conflict with Satan on any other basis but the cross, we will be defeated. But on the basis of the cross, we can be totally victorious. Now because of these two important facts about the cross, Satan has a strategy against the church. He cannot change what has been accomplished by the cross. That's eternal. It's settled by God. But the, what he can do and what he seeks to do is to hide from the church what was accomplished by the cross. So that when the church loses sight of what was accomplished by the cross, then the church no longer enjoys the benefits provided. The church no longer lives in the full provision which was made by the cross and the church is no longer capable of administering Christ's defeat to Satan. Now this is brought out very clearly in one particular verse in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I have meditated on this verse now for at least 10 years probably longer. When I first read the verse, like so many verses in the Bible, I just read it and I didn't think much about it. But gradually it impacted me more and more. And I see in it myself today a key to understanding the problems of the church. This is what Paul says. Now there are two versions according to different original texts. I'm going to follow the shorter verse, version which is followed in the NIV and the NASB and probably others. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Now that's an amazing statement. Probably you've never been sufficiently amazed by it. But Paul says to these Spirit-filled Christians, and you'll see in a few moments, they'd been saved, they'd been baptized in the Spirit, they had witnessed and were witnessing miracles. But he says to them, who has bewitched you? Witchcraft is the, is the primary word for the spiritual forces released from Satan's kingdom into the earth. So these, quote, Spirit-filled Christians, and you know when I hear the word Spirit-filled, uh, and I see the lives of some people called spirit-filled, I say, yes, but just a thimbleful. <laughs> you can fill a thimble, you can fill a cup, or you can fill a bath. All of them are filled, but they're not, they don't contain the same amount. Uh, but when I see the lives of spirit-filled Christians, I say to myself, 
they don't realize that Satan has a strategy against them of which they're not aware. Actually, I found myself in a situation in 1963, I don't want to go back into the details. I had just uh, immigrated to the United States. I'm one of the few people who immigrated to the United States by accident because I came for a visit. The immigration authorities at the border told me that six months was too long for a visit well, I said, maybe you can help me because I've dealt with a lot of uh, immigration authorities in different countries and I know you never argue with them. You just put yourself at their mercy. So they said, come on in and we'll arrange it. And so that way, I, with my first wife and our five-year-old adopted black African daughter, made it into the States. Now, if we'd ever made application outside with that particular combination, we'd never have been accepted, you understand? So that was God's way of sneaking us into the United States. Anyhow, I found myself a little while later pastoring a Pentecostal church in Seattle, Washington. And I cannot go into the problems of that church, but let me just briefly state what had happened, just to give you some kind of idea of what can happen to spirit-filled people. The wife of the pastor fell in love with one of the board members and as a result the pastor's wife divorced the pastor the board member divorced his wife and the pastor's wife and the board member married and carried on pastoring the church now, all this was publicly known there was no secret about it well you'd say that couldn't happen in a Pentecostal church it could and it did and when I talked with the people, they said to me, there's something about that woman. When she looks at you, your blood runs cold and you just don't know what to say. And she had actually gained total control over that congregation. And my first wife and I, Lydia and I, really, we'd never been in a situation like that. And I, I began to seek God. I didn't know what to do about it because... By that time, she had moved out, but the congregation was still under her domination. And I read this verse, Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And I said, that's it. They're bewitched. I couldn't believe at first that, you know, Pentecostal Christians could be bewitched. But when I grasped the truth, and Lydia and I took our stand, agreeing together in prayer, we broke that power, the congregation was released, the situation was restored. But that was where I was first introduced to the reality of Galatians 3, 1, who has bewitched you. Now how did Paul know that they were bewitched? The second part of the verse tells us they had lost the vision of Jesus Christ crucified. What had witchcraft done? It had moved in and obscured the reality of the cross and all that was obtained for them through the cross. What was the result of losing the vision of Jesus Christ crucified? I believe this will always be the result. And I believe it's the result in many, many congregations today. They went into carnality and legalism. And basically, wherever you find legalism, it's the product of carnality even though it may sound extremely spiritual and legalistic people often think they're more spiritual than others nevertheless it's an expression of the flesh of carnality and not of spirituality and it goes together with the works of the flesh let's read these next verses verses 2 through 5 and I think you'll see the truth of what I've been saying this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith? Notice they had received the Spirit. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? They had begun in the Spirit. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Notice, God was working miracles among them. They were saved, baptized in the Spirit, and they had miracles taking place. 
and yet they were bewitched. And Paul says two results expressed in this, uh, the works of the law and the works of the flesh. Legalism, carnality. Now legalism is one of those words that Christians tend to use to criticize other Christians. So I'm going to offer you a definition so that it's not vague. As I understand legalism, it's the attempt to achieve righteousness with God by observing any set of rules whatever. Whether it's the law of Moses or Pentecostal law or Baptist law or Catholic law it makes no difference. Anyone who is seeking to achieve righteousness with God by observing a law or a set of rules is in legalism. An alternative definition is this. Legalism is adding anything whatever to the requirements which God has laid down for achieving righteousness with him. And God has said all that is needed is to believe in him who delivered Jesus to death for our offenses and raised him again for our justification. No person, no church, no organization, and no Bible teacher has any authority ever to add any requirement to achieving righteousness with God except that, believing in the one who delivered Jesus for our sins and raised him for our justification. And any addition to that, in my understanding, is legalism. So here were people who had begun in the spirit, who had seen miracles, but who had been tricked by Satan because Satan had obscured the reality of what took place on the cross and they'd gone back into fleshly attempts to please God by keeping rules. Does that sound like anybody you've ever met? Does that sound like any churches you've ever been in? In America, and I'm not talking about other countries necessarily, but a lot of churches call themselves Grace Church. <laughs> My observation is the ones that talk most about grace generally know least about it. They are centers of legalism. <laughs> now, the result of this is even more shocking. It's stated in the 10th verse, Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Understand, if you're going to be justified by the law of Moses, you've got to keep the whole law all the time. And if you fail to do that and you've put yourself under the law, you bring a curse upon yourself. For the law itself, itself says, Cursed is everyone who does not keep all the law all the time. So the result of this cross being obscured by Satan's activities were legalism, carnality, and a curse. That's a solemn statement. I'll give you just one other scripture which says in one verse what took place to the Galatians, with the Galatians. In Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah 17 and verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength or his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. The curse is pronounced on somebody of whom it says his heart departs from the Lord. So this is a person who has known the supernatural grace of God and experienced it in his life, but then he turns back to making flesh his strength. In other words, he turns back to the best he can do by his own efforts. And in doing that, if I may use the phrase, he has snubbed the spirit of grace. He has in effect said to the Holy Spirit, you're not good enough. I think I can do it better my way. And on that behavior, God pronounces a curse. If you want to look at the next verse, you'll see as vivid a description of somebody under a curse in one verse as you could ever wish for. Jeremiah 17 verse 6 For he, the man under the curse, shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. 
He shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. What a vivid picture of somebody under a curse. Blessings are all around him. Rain falls, the earth is fruitful, but it never reaches him. He lives in a dry, barren, cursed land. Oh, how many hundreds of people I've dealt with in that category since God has given me this understanding of how a curse operates and how people can be delivered. But I want to challenge you tonight to consider as I've described the problem of the Galatians, could it be your problem? Could it be the problem of your church? Could it be perhaps the primary problem of the professing church today? Because almost every major movement in the church began with a supernatural sovereign visitation of God. Otherwise they would never have impacted history. No matter which denomination you go to, and I don't want to name any specific denomination, they began because God visited them sovereignly with supernatural power. How many of them today are relying on the same sovereign supernatural power as gave them birth? I would say very few, if any. I, I introduce this message this way because I want you to see we're dealing with something that's real and current and extremely important. It's not some remote little group somewhere that's gone astray. It's Satan's main weapon against the Church of Jesus Christ is to obscure the reality of the cross. And what results, as I understand it, is that what I call the soulish is substituted for the spiritual. Now man is spirit, soul and body. The soul has its legitimate functions, but it cannot take the place of the spirit. But when people move away from the supernatural and begin to rely on their own ability and efforts, they move out of the spiritual and into the soulish. And I'll give you just a list of different ways that this manifests itself in a church or the church. And these are just examples. I'm not making a law out of them. I'm just giving you some examples. But what I'm saying is a religious substitute takes the place of the spiritual reality. And here's a list of seven substitutions. As I go through them, just check and see. First of all, theology takes the place of revelation. Theology is man's reasoning. It's making, what would I say, rules, inferences, but it's not direct revelation. Education takes the place of character building. Uh, I think you should notice that Jesus never just taught people. They had to follow him. In other words, it wasn't just intellectual knowledge, but it was a lifestyle that was imparted. It's very, very dangerous to train people intellectually and not deal with their character. Because the scripture says the carnal mind is enmity against God. So when you educate the carnal mind, you're educating an enemy of God. And what you get at the end is an educated enemy of God. And I would suggest to you the majority of seminaries today are producing educated enemies of God. I don't, that, I'm not trying to be dramatic, I just believe that's the way it is. In a, way, a certain sense, the main enemies of the gospel are the products of the seminaries. Thirdly, Psychology is substituted for discernment, which is supernatural. Fourth, program is substituted for supernatural direction, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Fifth, eloquence is substituted for supernatural power. Sixth, reasoning is substituted for the walk of faith. 
And seventh, laws take the place of love. I'll say that very quickly again. And as I do it, I just want you to think how much of it is relevant to your situation. Theology in place of revelation, education in place of character building, psychology in place of discernment, program in place of supernatural leading of the Holy Spirit, eloquence in place of supernatural power, reasoning in place of the walk of faith, and laws in place of love. Let me ask you a question. You don't, if you happen to know any Christians you would categorize as legalistic, if you happen to know them. Would you say they're very loving? <laughs> Somebody came up with the right answer. <laughs> See, laws and love in the Christian life tend to compete with one another. The people who are busy keeping and enforcing laws are often remarkably unloving people. If you want the standard biblical illustration, it's the Pharisees. Have you noticed how many miracles they, of Jesus they objected to? Blind eyes were opened, lame people walked. They never once expressed satisfaction at that. All they objected to was he was breaking their rules of the Sabbath. You'd thought even a Pharisee with a heart of stone would be glad when somebody who was born blind had his eyes open. Not so. They don't keep the Sabbath. Or he doesn't keep the Sabbath. All right, now, the important thing about Galatians is that not only does it reveal the problem, it reveals God's solution. To me, this is a wonderful example of the inspiration of Scripture. Because Paul didn't write a theological treatise. He sat down probably in some very difficult situation and dashed off a letter because he was deeply concerned about the Galatians. It's a comical thing about the Galatians. Their problem, as I've said, was legalism. And uh, Paul wrote letters to other churches and almost invariably he begins by thanking God for the churches he was writing to. He wrote to the Corinthians, there was incest, adultery, drunkenness at the Lord's table, and he still thanked God for the grace of God given to them. But when he comes to the Galatians, he is so upset that he doesn't thank God for them. He simply says, I marvel that you are so soon moved away from the grace of God. Legalism disturbed him much more than open sin. And it's a much subtler and more dangerous problem. All right, now let's look at the remedies. And this is why I've entitled this message, The Cross in Me. And I want to make this very personal to everybody here. You see, it's one thing to get excited about what God has done for you on the cross. It's quite different to embrace what the cross is intended to do in you. I have to say, in my present, in the circles in which I move at present, there's very little mention of made of what the cross is intended to do in us. And I would say, in my opinion, 90% of the church's problems are due to that one fact. You see, in the long run, you will not enjoy the benefits of what the cross has done for you unless you accept what the cross is intended to do in you. The, the cross in you is the safeguard of all the blessings and provisions of the cross for you. Galatians states five deliverances that are provided for us through the cross. And I want to go through them in the order in which they occur. The first one is stated in Galatians 1 verses 3 and 4. And I think it's one, my guess would be 90% of you have never even thought about it. I may be wrong, if I am, forgive me. One of the reasons I say that is I went a long while as a Christian and a preacher without thinking about it myself. See. All right, Galatians 1, 3, and 4. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins on the cross, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God. So through the cross, God has provided deliverance from this present evil age. Now, there are two Greek words that are used in Galatians, and it's necessary to separate them. 
The King James, and even the New King James, doesn't observe the distinction all the time. The word used here in Greek is ion, from which we get the English word eon. And it means an age, a period of time. The other word, which is also used in Galatians 6.14, and we'll come to it at the end of this series of, of studies, is cosmos, which is translated world. I'll talk about world later, but let's look for a moment at the concept of age. We are living in a certain age. There were other ages before us, and there will be ages after this. And this present age is called an evil age. I'll show you very specifically why it's an evil age. But let's first of all take note of the fact the present age is going to end. If you live as though it were never going to end, you're living under a delusion. Personally, when I say the present age is going to end, you know what I say next? Thank God. <laughs> I wouldn't want this age to continue the way it is forever. Look at uh, the parables of Jesus in Matthew chapter 13. You know, this is the chapter with the seven parables. And I don't intend to go into the parables. I just want to take some quotations. Interpreting the parable of the wheat and the tares in verse 39, Jesus says, The enemy who sowed the tares is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And in the next verse he says, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. And in verse 48, in another parable, he says again, so it will be at the end of the age. And you could find many other scriptures. But it's extremely important for us always to remember the present age is going to end. It is not permanent. If we live and think as if it were permanent, we're living under a delusion. And the power behind that delusion is witchcraft. Now, let's explain why it's an evil age. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. Well, you need to read verse 3 to get the context. Paul says, but even if our gospel is veiled or hidden, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, etc., who is the God of the age who's blinded the minds of these people? Satan, that's right. So you understand, Satan doesn't want the age to end. You know why? Because as long as this age continues, he's a God. When this age comes to an end, he ceases to be a God. So he is doing everything in his power to delay the close of the age. And the church should be doing everything in its power to precipitate the close of the age. But if Satan can blind the minds of the church, then the church will not do what God expects the church to do to bring about the close of the age. And then in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, the writer of Hebrews speaks about people who've received a series of experiences which I think most of us here have received. Hebrews 6, beginning about somewhere in verse 4. People who, and you'll notice there are five experiences, 
who were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come. Notice that when we taste the Holy Spirit, we taste the powers of the next age. We are, as it were, by that experience, lifted out of the present age into the next age. And we begin to experience in a little way what it will be like to be in the next age. I'll give you one illustration, which is a little difficult to explain. But Paul says, the body we have in this age, that's in 1 Corinthians 15, is a soulish body. In other words, it's a body which only operates as the soul directs it. So if my spirit wants my body to do something, my spirit has to work through my soul. Like David wanted to praise the Lord with his mouth, so his spirit spoke to his soul and said, Bless the Lord, O my soul. But the spirit couldn't start blessing the Lord without the cooperation of the soul. You see what I'm saying? That's called a soulish body. But the next age, Paul says, I will have a spiritual body. What does that mean? As I understand it, and I could be wrong, time will show, uh, it will mean that our spirit directly controls our body. We don't have to persuade our soul. If I want to fly to the next planet, I just take off. I don't have to argue with my soul about the rights and wrongs of the journey. Uh, well, as you see, what I'm leading up to is, when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you taste the powers of the age to come. Because when you speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives you utterance, for the first time, probably, your spirit is directly controlling your tongue. <laughs> it doesn't have to go through the bottleneck of your silly little mind. <laughs> you see that? That's why this is one reason why this is such a tremendously significant experience. Because for most of us, it's the only way at present in which we can experience what it'll be like to live in the next age. I don't have to think when I speak in tongues, you understand? Now, my soul has to consent. If my soul says no, and a lot of people's carnal mind says, no, I don't want to speak in tongues, I don't understand what I'm saying. So if your soul holds out, you can't do it. But my soul has capitulated. So when I want to speak in tongues, I can. See, I don't know what I'm saying, but I know it's good because the Holy Spirit gave it. See, when you speak in the Spirit, your tongue does what it's always supposed to do. It glorifies the Lord. You'll never say one wrong word as long as the Holy Spirit is controlling your tongue. So, anyhow, what I'm trying to put, convince you of is there's going to be a different kind of way of living in the next age. Our spirit is going to be in direct control of our body. We won't be limited by our silly little minds, our souls. Okay, and then going back to Matthew 13, we find another problem connected with this present age. Matthew 13 and verse 22. Interpreting the parable of the sower, Jesus speaks about the kind of seed that fell on rocky soil. And he says, Matthew 13:22. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this age and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So this age has cares. I think both the NIV and the NASB use the word worries. I think another good word is cares. When you are too preoccupied with the things of the present age, that preoccupation makes the Word of God unfruitful in you. It chokes out the Word of God. Thank God we can be delivered from this present evil age. You see how necessary it is. And then in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul has another statement. Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't think the way the people of this age think. 
You've got to learn to think differently. I'll tell you the main difference. The people of this age are essentially self-centered. That's one almost universal description. Their attitude about anything is, what will I get out of this? But the person whose mind has been renewed thinks differently. What will God get out of this? His own life is no longer the center. His life is God-centered. And then finally, and really this is tragic, terribly solemn, a faithful servant of Christ cannot love this present age. Second Timothy chapter 4, one of the most sad statements in the writings of Paul. Here he is at the end of his life, in prison, awaiting trial and probable execution. He has just a few faithful co-workers that are stuck with him. And one of the ones he is counting on is named Demas. And then he says, and he says it all in one sentence. Second uh, Timothy 4 verse 10. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present age. See, in the long run, if you love this present age, you cannot be faithful to God. As they say, when the chips are down, you will take the wrong direction. Very, very searching thought. Let me ask you this question. Are you in any way in love with this present age? Are you living as if it was going to go on forever? Have you got all your eggs in the basket of this present age? Because one day the whole basket's going to drop and all the eggs will be smashed. All right. One second deliverance. We move on now in Galatians to chapter 2 and verse 19. And this is probably the hardest one for Christians to understand, according to my observation. I have spent many, many hours trying to persuade Christians of the reality of this. And I just don't know how far I've been successful. Paul says in Galatians 2.19, this is the second deliverance, I call it deliverance from the law. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. Why does he say, I, through the law, died to the law? Because the law inflicted on me the death penalty. It was the law that caused me to be put to death. And when I was put to death, that was the end of the law. See, the last thing the law can do to anybody is put them to death. Once that's happened, they're clear of the law. It doesn't matter whether you've committed one murder or 60 murders. If you're executed, that's all the law can do to you. See, there is no other way out from under the law. Death is the only escape. The marvelous mercy and grace of God is the execution took place 19 centuries ago. When Jesus died, I died in him. He paid on my behalf the final penalty of the law that I might be clear from the demands of the law. In a session yesterday, I pointed out that it says in Colossians chapter 2 that the law is nailed to the cross. It doesn't go beyond the cross. It can follow you up to the cross. It can pursue you. It can hound you. It can accuse you. It can den condemn you. But once you get beyond the cross, you're free from the law. There's no more condemnation. It's all over. Now, Paul says, I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. If you analyze that, the meaning is clear. If you're living to the law, you're not living to God. If you're living to God, you're not living to the law. You cannot have it both ways. You can't combine the two. 
This is one of the clearest and most repeated statements of the New Testament, and yet I find that basically Christians are completely unfamiliar with it. And it shocks them. As I said to a group of people sometime recently, and I was quite casual, I mean I wasn't trying to shock them, but I said Christianity is not a set of rules. And their faces registered dismay. I think if I'd said, there is no God, they would have been less shocked. <laughs> See, I have dealt with this, I think because of my background as a philosopher. Immediately I was saved, I began to see in the New Testament, this is probably the most decisive single issue. is the relationship between the law and grace. And it's not altogether simple. Uh, I think the difficulty is because we're not used to thinking God's way. I don't think it's very complicated. It just means a total adjustment of our thinking. I can see some of your faces now. If, if you could see your own faces, you'd be shocked. All right. Look in Galatians 3, verses 11 and 12. And you understand this is the end of this passage about being under a curse because they've been bewitched. And it says, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now, I happen to be able to read the New Testament in Greek. I started learning Greek when I was 10 years old, and I learned it for 16 years. And what I want to say, you can check if you have access to the original text. In most of the places in the New Testament where it says the law, the original says law. And it makes a difference. This is one of them. Let me read it the other way. But that no one is justified by law in the sight of God is evident. Now Paul means primarily you will not be justified by keeping the law of Moses. But he doesn't stop there. He says you cannot achieve righteousness with God by keeping any law. It's ruled out. It's impossible. Don't waste time trying. Then Paul goes on in verse 12, Yet the law is not of faith, but the one who does them shall live by them. If you can keep the whole law all the time, that's fine, you're righteous. But nobody ever has, you see. And if you can only keep a little of the law some of the time, it does you no good whatever from the point of view of achieving righteousness. So there are two alternatives. You're justified by the law, or you're justified by faith, but you cannot mix them. Is that clear? A little later on, Paul uses a little parable from the family of Abraham. And he gives the example of Ishmael, who was the child of the slave woman, who is a type of the product of the law. Because Hagar, he says, corresponds to Mount uh, Sinai, where the law was given. And then, Sarah is a type of the spirit, a supernatural birth, which gave, which brought forth Isaac, who's the child of grace. But, Paul points out, when, Ishmael, when Isaac came, Ishmael had to go. They could not coexist in the same family. And he quotes the statement, cast out, and the statement is by God himself, Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Not only do you get rid of Ishmael, you get rid of Hagar, see. So you have to choose. Whom are you going to have in your house? Are you going to keep Ishmael? Or are you going to make room for Isaac? The child of grace, the supernatural. See, Ishmael was the best that Abraham could do by his own efforts. But it wasn't good enough. And the best you can do by your efforts is not good enough. You can keep on trying and sweating and working and even praying. But it's not good enough. So if you want grace, you've got to say no to law. You understand? <laughs> this, is a, this is so vivid that most of us would like to hold on to both. See? A little bit of grace, a little bit of law. God says it won't work. I don't accept that. If you can't trust grace wholly, then you aren't trusting grace at all. 
If you have to help grace with law, you're not really experiencing grace. Now let's turn to Romans chapter 6 and verses 6 and 7. Here is the deliverance. Knowing this, do you know it or do you not know it? Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Where was our old man crucified and when? When Jesus died on the cross. That's a historical fact. You can't change that. But knowing it and believing it will change you, you see. We're dealing with facts. You have to know the whole gospel is based on facts. Historical facts. Unlike almost any other world religion. I don't know of any other world religion that's based on facts. Their systems, their theories, their revelations untied to any particular period of history. But the gospel is based on historical facts. It's either true or it's false. Personally, I believe it's true. Now, Paul says, until this old nature, this Adamic nature, this rebel that's called the old man has been put to death, we'll be the slaves of sin. The only way out is to deal with the old man. He's a rebel. As I've said many times, God's solution is execution. He doesn't improve him, he doesn't send him to church, he doesn't teach him the golden rule. Execute him. But the mercy of God is the execution took place when Jesus died on the cross. That's God's mercy. All right. So, Paul goes on to say, and this is the next verse, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now that's the translation that's followed in almost every version. But the word, if you look in the margin, if you have a margin, it means has been justified from sin. Because once you've paid the last penalty, you're justified. The law has nothing more to say to you. It can do nothing more against you. Death is the way out from the dominion of the law. It's also the way out from the dominion of sin. Going on in Romans chapter 6 verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law but under grace. Which are you under? You can't be under both. If you're under law, you're not under grace. If you're under grace, you're not under law. And Paul very clearly implies, if you are under law, sin will have dominion over you. That astonishes people. But that's the way it is. Because while you're under law, you're doing the best you can with your own efforts. And they're not good enough. They're like Ishmael. They never earn God's favor. And then in Romans 7, verses 5 and 6. For when we were in the flesh... The passions of sins which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Did you hear that phrase? The passion of sins which were aroused by the law were at work in our members. Paul explains a little further on, I can't go into detail, he said, I didn't know what covetousness was until I encountered the commandment, thou shalt not covet. But when the commandment came, covetousness rose up in me. Have you ever experienced that? It's when you're told not to do something that it really gains dominion over you, see? So the sin is actually stirred up by the law. As long as we're relying on our own efforts. You have to read the whole of Romans chapter 7 really to get there. But Paul says, the next verse, but now we have been delivered from the law. Delivered from what? From the law. I must explain, we're not talking about secular law. That doesn't mean you can break the law of the government by any means. We're talking about law as a means of achieving righteousness with God. I believe Christians should be law-abiding persons. Now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Paul uses a picture in the previous verses, which is a little complicated, so I'll try to simplify it. He gives a the example of a woman who's married to a husband. As long as her husband remains alive, if she marries another, she's an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free to marry another man. The application is, through the law, we were married to our fleshly nature. We were absolutely committed to do what we could in our flesh. 
as long as our fleshly nature remained alive, we were not free to be married to anybody else. But on the cross, our fleshly nature was put to death. Can you say praise God? So that we are now free to be married to another. Who's the other? The resurrected Christ. And you see, when we were married to the flesh, what we brought forth was the product of the flesh. Now we're married to the resurrected Christ, what we bring forth is the product of the Spirit. You see the picture? All right, let's go on faithfully, plowing ahead. 2 Corinthians 3, 3. Paul says to the Corinthian Christians, I love this statement, because Paul says in effect, if you want to know my theology, go to Corinth. You'll find it written there in the lives of the people I've ministered to. I like that kind of theology. Paul says, you want to know I believe? Go to Corinth. You'll meet people who were fornicators, adulterers, pimps, homosexuals, drunkards, extortionists, living godly lives. That's my theology. They're my letter. If the ancient world wanted to know what Paul believed, he says, go to Corinth. I don't want to put it down in a theological treatise. And then he says this, You are manifestly an epistle or letter of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Here is the difference between law and grace. Law is tablets of stone outside you that says, do this and don't do that. And you say, that's right, I'll do this and I won't do that, and you fail. Because there's a rebel inside you that doesn't cooperate. But grace doesn't hold something up outside you and say, do that. Grace, by the Holy Spirit, writes the laws of God on your heart. And when it's in your heart, that's the way you live, you see. Solomon said, keep your heart with all diligence, for everything in life comes out of it. So, isn't that a marvelous thought? You see, I can't write what I'm trying to communicate on your hearts, but if the Holy Spirit is here, he'll write on your hearts. None of us, by our own efforts and theology and ministry, can change a single person. But if the Holy Spirit works, he can write on the hearts of those to whom we minister, and they become changed. That's the difference. Law is external. Grace is internal. Going on with these scriptures, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God, mature sons. What do you have to do to become a mature son of God once you've been born again? You have to be led by the Holy Spirit. There is no other path to maturity. And you see, it's like this. It's God says you've got a journey to take. You've got two options. Here's a map. It's perfect. Or you can have a personal guide. The map is the law. The personal guide is who? The Holy Spirit. That's right. So you're young, strong, healthy. You've got two degrees from a university. And you say, give me the map. <laughs> I can read maps. I'll make it. About 48 hours later, it's the middle of the night, it's raining hard, pitch dark, and you're on the edge of a precipice, and you don't know whether you're facing north, south, east, or west. And then a gentle voice says, can I help you? <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, I need you. Help me. Well, you get out of that mess, you get onto the road, and the sun begins to shine, and you think, well, I was pretty dumb. I didn't have to get so panicky. I think I'll have another look at the map. And you do. And when you look up, your guide isn't there anymore, see? And so you carry on with the map, and about two days later you're in the middle of a bog, and every step you take you're sinking deeper. And you think, what do I do now? I can't ask the guide back. But he comes back. He says, let me help you. That really is the story of the Christian life. How many times do we have to go back to the map when we've got the guide? You say, but I'm afraid I'll do the wrong thing without law. Let me tell you one thing for sure. The Holy Spirit will never lead you to do the wrong thing. Okay? If you are truly led by the Holy Spirit, you'll always do the right thing. You cannot rely on your own efforts. 
But God has made a way for you to escape from the obligations of the law through the death of Christ on the cross. Our old man was crucified. That's a general statement. Paul makes it specific. I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. We have to take the general and by our confession make it specific. Would you like to do that to close this session? Say those words after me, if you really mean them. And if you don't mean them, don't say them. I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. Do it once more. I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. Now, heave a deep sigh and say, thank God. Continuing with the theme which I entitled, The Cross in My Life. This teaching is taken mainly from the Epistle to the Galatians. And in the previous session I began by pointing out that there are two main aspects to the cross. There's what the cross does for us, which we all get excited about, and quite a lot of people preach about. But there's another side, which is what the cross is intended to do in us. And for many people, that's much less exciting. And I think a lot less is said about it. And I said also, the remarkable thing about Galatians is it not merely pinpoints the problem, but it states the solution. And the solution is a five-fold deliverance, which is provided for us through the cross. And in the previous sessions, we looked at the first two deliverances. Galatians 1 verse 4, deliverance from this present evil age. The second deliverance, how many of you can remember what that was? From the law. That's right. And that was one which shocked some of you. I do want to say again emphatically, I am not talking about civil law. I'm not talking about the law of the nation. I'm talking about the law only as a means of achieving righteousness with God. I personally believe the New Testament teaches that basically, with a few exceptions, Christians are obligated to be law-abiding people. The only exceptions would be where the civil law conflicts with our duty to God, in which case our duty to God must come first. All right, now there are three more deliverances that I want to deal with in this session. The next one is in the verse following deliverance from the law. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And notice again, it's the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that provides this deliverance. Now, what is it that is dealt with in verse 20? And you can answer not just in one word, but in one letter. I, that's right. The old ego. You know, ego is the Latin word for I. I think this is as important as any deliverance that's mentioned in Galatians. I 
have been crucified with Christ. The old King James says, I am crucified with Christ. It's not just something that has happened, it's something that's a continuing state of my being. I am continuously and permanently crucified with Christ. I have come to the end of myself. How many of you, don't put your hands up here, how many of you have had a hard time coming to the end of yourself? I see some of you are willing to put your hands up anyhow. Uh, how many of you discovered that God sometimes has to use a very hard road to bring us to the end of ourselves? And we complain and we are uh, disturbed and upset and we think, God, what are you doing with me? He's bringing you to the place where Galatians 2.20 really is true in your life. I am crucified with Christ. I've come to the end of me. You see... <clears throat> Uh, I've, like most ministers, I've dealt with all sorts of people in all sorts of places. And I meet many people who are running away from their problems. And they're maybe running away from their wife, or their husband, or their family, or some particular problem they got in. But what I discover is, the real problem is one we can't run away from. Because we take it with us wherever we go. What is that? It's me, myself. The only way that we can get free from that problem is through the cross. I would interpret this statement as escape from personal ambition, pride, and self-centeredness. Let me say those three words again. Personal ambition, pride, and self-centeredness. And I would say those are the far the commonest problems in the Christian ministry today. I, I must be careful not to be negative, but I think there's not a single person in the ministry today, including Derek Prince, and primarily Derek Prince, who does not have to be continually on our guard against those Three related things, personal ambition, pride, and self-centeredness. I've come to the conclusion that nobody in the Christian life goes into error except through pride. Pride is the only reason why Satan can bring us into error. And yet I see countless Christians going into different sorts of error. You see, if you stop to consider what was the first sin in the history of the universe? Pride, that's right. And it didn't take place on earth. It took place in heaven. It took place in the full light of eternity and of God's glory. That's a frightening thought, isn't it? So if pride could break through there, it must be much more easy for pride to break through here on earth. I was born an only child. I never had brothers or sisters. Uh, but I was blessed with a good brain. And I was always successful at school and in college. Basically, I expected to be number one. And I made my way up to the age of 25 that way. A brother that has ministered with me quite a lot in the past said one day that I was the most um, what did he say? Self-reliant person he'd ever met. I don't know whether that's true or not. But all through the first 25 years of my life, I relied on myself. And within limits, I did a good job. Then God <laughs> revealed himself to me and started to change me. Let me say he hasn't finished changing me yet, but he did a radical work in one night. He totally redirected me. I made a U-turn. I've been going in a different direction ever since. But God, I would have to say, has a sense of humor. Because uh, I had no idea what his plan for my life was, but about <coughs> four or five years after I was saved, <coughs> I was married to a Danish lady in 
Jerusalem, who had a children's home. And not only did I get a wife, but I got eight daughters in one day. Now, girls were a strange, remote race to me. And so if you could ever think of anybody less qualified by background than me for that position, you'd have to look a long way. And all through this, I've realized for years God has been dealing with my self-reliance. I'm one of those people, every time I'm confronted with a problem, my first reaction is, what am I going to do about it? Thank God I've come to the place where I quickly say, that's not the point. What is God's answer? But it's taken a long while for me to get there. Let's look for a moment in, Gal in Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So that's the exact opposite of self-centeredness, isn't it? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. I wonder how much would stop being done in the church if that rule was followed. How much ministry is motivated by selfish ambition? How many ministries are built on somebody's desire to have the biggest something? I don't say this to be critical, but I just state it as it's, it's a problem that I think it's corrupting the life of the church. And it's a problem that's got to be dealt with. And the only way to deal with it is the cross. There is no other way. You see, the alternative is stated just in the previous two verses of Philippians 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, those are beautiful things. They're things we'd all love, but you say they're incompatible with selfishness and self-centeredness. Then Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So there are two opposites. Verses 1 and 2 are what we'd all like, but verses 3 and 4 are what very frequently we experience in ourselves and in others. And until we come to the cross and accept God's sentence upon me, we will never have a solution to these problems. There is no other solution. There's no other way but the cross. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we have a very vivid picture of what human character and human behavior will be like in the last days. There are actually 18 specific ethical and moral blemishes that Paul lists. As I read them, I invite you to consider how many of them are conspicuous in our contemporary culture. And having lived over 70 years, I can think back quite a long way. I grew up in Britain between the two world wars. And I'd have to say that Britain, although not by any means a Christian nation, was basically a law-abiding people. And uh, I find that when I talk to young British people today and tell them what it was like in those days, they can't believe that I'm telling the truth. I also visited the nation of Sweden for the first time in 1947 for ministry. And I'd have to say Sweden was the most God-fearing nation that I'd ever been in. You could sense the fear of God in the streets. The people lined up in the streets on Sunday morning to get into the churches. And basically you could trust the people to be absolutely honest and true to their commitments. I was in Sweden in 1980, what, three or four? And I was interviewed by a young Christian Swedish journalist. And he was asking about my background. When I told him 
what I remembered of Sweden in that time, he could not believe that I was describing his own nation. So rapid and so radical has been the moral and ethical slide in Sweden. Now, I first came to this nation in 1967. And it was a peaceful, harmonious nation. I don't mean that everybody was Christian, but basically it was almost the kind of place you'd like to come to to get away from your problems. Could that be said today? You see, there's something going on all over the world. It's going on with amazing rapidity. We can hardly adjust to the pace of the change. But it's described here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. <coughs> One thing I like about the Bible is it tells it as it is. It's never sentimental, never indulges in wishful thinking. Its promises are true, but its warnings are equally true. So this is what Paul says. But know this, you can be sure of this that in the last days perilous times will come. In the, in the margin of my version, the alternative translation for perilous times is times of stress. That's really remarkable because again, 40 years ago, people didn't talk a lot about stress. Today, you can't go to any doctor without him sort of saying, your problem is stress, and he may well be right. But it's a significant change that's taken place in the last 50 years. Now let's look at the reason for the perilous times. And let me tell you, it's not nuclear fission. The reason for the problem is inside human beings. That's where the problems begin. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. How many of the features in that list are conspicuous in our contemporary culture? And it's not just in one nation. It's in many, many nations around the earth. But what I want to point out to you is the root of the problems. It's in the first statement. Men will be lovers of themselves. It's self-love that gives rise to all these other problems. And you would say then, well, after all, these people are not churchgoers. They're not Christians. But that's not what Paul says. He says in the next verse, having a form of godliness. Now, Paul would never use the word godliness of a non-Christian religion. So these were people who have a form of Christianity but they deny its power. <clears throat> what is the power that they deny? The power that will change selfish people. <laughs> That's what Paul's talking about. You see, it's easy for a Christian to be very respectable, to abstain from drugs and alcohol and nicotine and all these obvious sins and to uh, pay his debts and drive a good car and not infringe the traffic laws and yet to be a very self-centered person. Is that true? And such a person has a form of godliness but is denying its power to change people radically. And until self is dealt with, we have not been changed radically. You know what the word radical means? It's derived from the Latin word radix, a root. A radical is that which goes to the root. And that's how John the Baptist introduced the gospel and Jesus. He said, now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. And every tree that does not bring forth good fruit will be hewn down and cast into the fire. The gospel is the most radical message that has ever confronted humanity. It deals with the root. And the root is selfishness. It's the self-life, the self-love. And the only axe that will cut that root out 
is the cross. See, I became involved in the ministry of deliverance in the 1960s. And I began to work with the obvious sins, like people who needed deliverance from nicotine, or alcohol, or uh, drugs. But after a while I discovered I was only dealing with small branches that grew on bigger branches. Some of the bigger branches, one of them was frustration. I found every addiction grows out of a frustration. And if you don't deal with the frustration, you haven't really solved the root of the, solved the problem of the addiction. And then I realized that I was still dealing with branches, but I wasn't getting to the trunk of the tree. And you see, you can cut down a lot of branches, but the tree will go on growing, and it'll grow more branches. And finally, God showed me I had to deal with the root. And the root is self-love selfishness, self-centeredness. And until that root has been dealt with, we really cannot have the benefits of the gospel that God intends us to have. Self and the Christ nature are opposites. We have to let self die and the Christ nature move in and take the place of self. Now, I'm not saying what I'm trying to say is this, be realistic about yourself. Don't overestimate your spirituality. I'm not bringing anybody under condemnation because God is gracious, he's merciful, he's patient, patient, he'll go on dealing with us. But don't deceive yourself that you're beyond where you really are spiritually. Check on how much self still dominates your life because that will tell you the answer. Now in Matthew 16, Jesus stated the rules for following him. You notice I say rules, but because of what I've been preaching about rules, I probably better say the first steps you have to take. Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25. Jesus said to his disciples, he didn't talk to the crowd, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life, but the Greek says soul, will lose it. And whoever loses his life or soul for my sake will find it. So what are the essential first steps if you want to follow Jesus? Not if you want to be born again. You know, being born again has become a kind of label that just exonerates people from the responsibilities of Christianity. I'm born again, so don't tell me that I need to change. I'm not convinced. Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, what's the first thing he has to do? Deny himself. What does that mean? You know what deny is? It's say no. So if you want to follow Jesus, the first thing you have to do is to say no to yourself. The second thing you have to do is take up your cross. God doesn't impose the cross on you. He didn't impose the cross on Jesus. Jesus took up his own cross. What is your cross? The two definitions I'll offer you. One is your cross is the place where God's will and your will cross. The other is it's the place where you die. Now. It's your decision. You don't have to do it. But you can't follow Jesus till you've done it. If you want to come after him, you have to deny yourself, say no to yourself, and take up your cross, the place where you'll die. And God has a specific cross for each one of us. I've met more than one man who thought his wife was his cross. <laughs> if you can take your wife up or put her down, maybe. But your cross is something you don't have to carry. It's your decision. But you can't advance any further without it. What does it mean to deny yourself? Well, in the Greek, it's deny your soul. And uh, generally speaking, Bible commentators say the three functions of the soul are the will, the intellect, and the emotions. The will is what says, I want. 
the uh, intellect is what it says I think and the emotions are what say I feel. So when you deny yourself, you say it's not what I want, it's, what, it's God's will. It's not what I think, it's what God says. It's not what I feel, it's what the Holy Spirit impresses upon me. So there are three areas where you have to deny yourself. Not what I want, not what I think, and not what I feel. When you've done that, you can begin to follow Jesus. After that, you can begin to say Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Prince version is I can do all things through the one who empowers me within. But you cannot receive his power within as long as you're operating your self-life. Okay, we must move on. We've got two more deliverances to consider. The next one is in Galatians 5, 24. Galatians 5, 24. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What's the deliverance from there? I didn't hear you. The, they have crucified the one? The flesh. So what are you delivered from there? The flesh, that's right. Now we have to define what the flesh is. The flesh is not your physical body. But it's the nature that you received when you were born in your physical body. And it's essentially the nature of a rebel. It has all sorts of desires and feelings that are not in line with God's will and are not subject to God. And God's remedy? Crucifixion. You see, as far as God's concerned, the crucifixion... Well, let me say a little bit more about the nature of the flesh. Notice that phrase there, first of all. Galatians 5.24, those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's not a denomination. But those are the people who belong to God. It's not Baptists or Pentecostals or Presbyterians. It's those who are Christ. What's the mark? What separates the mark from the others? I didn't hear you. <coughs> they have crucified the flesh. If you turn for a moment to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23, you'll find the people that Jesus is coming back for. You want to know who they are? It's not the Presbyterians, <laughs> nor the Baptists, nor the Pentecostals, nor the Catholics. It says in verse 23 about the resurrection, each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, he's already risen. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. Who is he coming for? Those who are Christ's. What's the mark of those who are Christ's? Galatians 5, 24. They have crucified the flesh. So who is Jesus coming back for? Christians who have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So now you know how you have to qualify.
You see, this nature that we're talking about is in direct opposition to the will and the way of God. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, Paul says, the carnal mind, now the word carnal is the same as fleshly. It's just a different word derived from a Latin root. The fleshly mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are controlled by their fleshly nature cannot please God. There is no way you can do it. You can try as hard as you will. You can be as religious as you please. But you cannot do it. And then in Galatians again, 5 and 17, Paul brings out the same thought. Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit of God, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another. Your natural fleshly desires are contrary to the way and the will of the Spirit of God, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Maybe that's a revelation to some of you. You set out with all sorts of good intentions, you consecrate yourself, you go forward at the altar of the church, you pray a nice prayer, so that's it. And about a month later you say, how could I ever have got so far away from what I intended to be and do? The answer is the flesh lusts against the spirit. You have in you an enemy of God. And that enemy has to be dealt with. You cannot lead the Christian life successfully until the flesh has been dealt with in you. Paul had that problem. Perhaps that will encourage you. It's not a problem just a few people have, it's universal. You need to read Romans chapter 7 right through sometime and see Paul's personal struggles against the flesh. My observation is the most dedicated Christians and the ones whom God intends to use the most are the ones that have the main struggles. You see, Pentecostals used to have the attitude, I think it's changed, I've been a Pentecostal for 48 years. The attitude used to be you get saved, baptized in water, baptized in the Spirit, speak in tongues, and you have no more problems. <laughs> How many of you know it doesn't work that way? <laughs> Wish it did. I know it doesn't. Why? Because it didn't work with me. And furthermore, I pastored Pentecostals long enough to find out it isn't like that. The reason is the flesh. It's an enemy. It's an enemy of God. Anyhow, listen to what Paul says about his own experience. In Romans 7, 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. None of you have ever had that experience. Paul was a unique, was he? Or was he? No. It's true of all of us. None of us can point a finger at somebody else and say, there you are, that's you. We need to look in the mirror and say, there you are, that's me. But Paul explains the reason. The reason is the fleshly nature in each one of us. It is not subject to God's law, nor can be. I would basically say religion, as opposed to salvation, is a system of trying to make the flesh behave. <laughs> makes it religious, but it doesn't enable it to please God, you see. <laughs> a lot of religious people are just suppressing the flesh. They're making it conform outwardly, but the inward attitude isn't there. In Galatians 5, you notice most of this comes from Galatians. What was the problem of the Galatians? carnality and legalism. So you see Paul is dealing with both. And he says in Galatians 5, 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident. There's a slight difference in the text. Some say one thing, some not, but the difference is not significant. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, drunkenness, 
revelries and the like. Now, if you analyze the works of the flesh, they fall into four categories, which I'll briefly mention. First of all, sexual immorality. That is adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness. Now, most people think that's what the works of the flesh are. They don't think that there's any other area that needs to be dealt with. But actually, that's by no means the greatest problem. The next area is the occult. Idolatry and sorcery, or the old King James says witchcraft. That's a work of the flesh. But when the flesh indulges in it, it becomes demonic, you understand. But the initial motivation for idolatry and witchcraft is the fleshly nature. Witchcraft is humanity's way of controlling people and getting them to do what you want. Any attempt to control others is the beginning of witchcraft. And when you go much further along that, it becomes demonic. So that's the second category. Now the third category, which is much the largest, is all wrong attitudes and relationships. And it lists here hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy. Now those are all different descriptions of wrong attitudes and wrong relationships. It's much the largest area of the flesh. So those are just as much sins of the flesh as adultery or fornication. But you see, basically speaking, religious people condone those, whereas they're strictly against sexual immorality. And then the final is what I call sensual self-indulgence, drunkenness, revelries, and the like but they're all different expressions of our fleshly nature. They all have to be dealt with. First Corinthians chapter 3, Paul pinpoints the cause of divisions in the church. First Corinthians chapter 3. If you were asked to say in one phrase, what is the cause of all division in the body of Christ, would you have an answer? I believe the answer is very clear. It's the flesh. All divisions go back to the carnal nature. And until that's dealt with, we'll always have division in the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Paul is writing to the Corinthian Christians. He says, you're still carnal. How does he know? For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men. The mere fact that there's divisions and strife is sufficient evidence that we're carnal. You see that? Then Paul says, how do I know it? Well, some of you say, I am of Paul, and others, I am of Apollos. As long as you are divided by following human leaders rather than Christ, you're carnal. See, I've heard theologians from the old line denomination say the Corinthian Christians were carnal because they spoke so much in tongues. That is not what Paul says. He says you're carnal because you're following human leaders rather than following Christ. And he didn't say it's all right to be following Paul, but not all right to be following Apollos. He said whoever you follow. So you see people who say I am of Luther, or I am of Wesley, or I am of Calvin, if they make that their first commitment, come under this category. A lot of people think theology is the cause of division. It's not. It's carnality. Of course, a lot of theology is used carnally. But the root cause of division in the body of Christ is the flesh. And the only solution is the cross. We need to deal with that, each one in our own situation. Now, in Romans 6, verse 6, a passage that we continually go back to, Paul states that God has provided the solution. Knowing this, 
that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So that's God's provision, execution. But God has made the provision, we must apply it. You understand? Christ has done his part, we have to add ours. And uh, there's a passage in First Peter which has spoken to me so powerfully. First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. In other words, be prepared for the same thing. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Now that's a rather surprising statement. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. For, for a long while I wondered about that because I thought to myself, well, Jesus suffered on our behalf, so why do we have to suffer? But I think God made it clear to me. Jesus has made the provision, we have to apply it. Our old man was crucified, that's happened. But Galatians 5.24 says those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. Who does it there? Not God, but we. And crucifixion, any way you look at it, is painful. So what do we have to do? We have to crucify our fleshly nature. We have to take those evil rebellious desires and attitudes and we have to nail them to the cross. One nail through my right hand, one nail through my left hand, one nail through my feet. I have to do that. That's not done for me. It's painful, but it's the way out of sin. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now let me give you an example because otherwise it's difficult for you to understand. The young example I usually take is this fine young Christian lady of about 20 years old who is a committed Christian. She's a member of a good fellowship. She has a pastor who's a godly man who really cares for her soul. But she becomes emotionally involved with a man who is not a committed Christian. He'll go to church just to get her but he really has never made a commitment of his life. And her godly pastor says, don't get involved with him. He's not really a committed Christian. It won't work out. Now she's got two options. Each of them is painful. She can accept her pastor's advice and nail her feelings and desires to the cross. You see, I love him. That's not the most important thing. I want to be married, that's not the most important thing. I'm afraid of being lonely, that's not the most important thing. Every one of those attitudes has to be nailed to the cross. That's painful, but it doesn't last for long. After a little while, there's a glorious freedom. And if we want a happy ending to the story, in due course, the right man comes along and she really gets married and is happy. That's the happy son. Now suppose that she doesn't do what she ought to do. Suppose that she doesn't crucify her attitudes and her desires and her emotions. She goes ahead and marries him. All right, 15 years later after she's had three children, he walks out with another woman. And she has to pick up the pieces of her life and handle a, a family without a head. That's far more painful and it lasts far longer. Hopefully, at the end of it all, she, she learns her lesson. She says, I was self-willed, self-pleasing. I gave way to my flesh. I didn't accept the cross. I was giving this example to a group some little while back, and a lady who was right in the front row, right in front of me, said, you've told my story exactly when I'd finished. She had just been divorced and her husband had left her with six children. Now I'm not saying all divorce springs from that cause.
but a lot of unhappy marriages of Christians are the result of not crucifying the flesh. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to take God's solution, which is painful, let's not be sentimental about it, it's painful to deny your strongest desires and wishes and feelings, or are you going to refuse the cross and suffer the consequences, which will be in the long run much more painful? That's the decision we have to make. I must move on to the fifth and final deliverance. Galatians 6, verse 14. Galatians 6, 14. God forbid that I should glory or boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now come on you theologians, what's the deliverance from there? The world, it didn't say it very firmly. From what? The world, that's right. Are you happy about that? Or does it cause you mixed emotions? Let's define the world first. Worldly is one of those terms that Christians use to criticize other Christians. That's not God's purpose. Uh, I mean, I've been through all that. I don't want to go through it again. You know, the, all the 17 rules of what you must not do in order not to be worldly. And I would say, basically, the people who make those rules are very worldly people. But that's just by the way. <laughs> what do we mean by the world? I'll give you my definition. The world is a social order or a system of life which refuses the righteous government of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is God's appointed governor. He's qualified. He's met the conditions. He's the only one whom God will appoint as ruler of the human race. But the, but the world is a system, an attitude, that refuses the righteous government of Jesus. Worldly people can be religious, they can be nice, they can be respectable, but when you challenge them with unreserved submission to the Lordship of Jesus, that attitude comes out. See? That's the world. Now let's look at a few things that the New Testament tells us about the world. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Two remarkable verses, because in these two verses, Jesus uses the phrase, the world, six times in two brief verses. And he says to his disciples, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. What did Jesus do to us? He chose us out of the world. You see, the word for church in New Testament Greek, ecclesia, from which we get the word ecclesiastical and so on, means literally a company of people called out. Called out from what? From the world. So you can either be in the world, or you can be in the church, but you cannot be in both. They're mutually exclusive. Now, let's see what John says about the attractiveness of the world, the glamour of the world. First John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. I think that's kind of question of age. If you're under 25, the temptation is to love the world. It seems so glamorous, it seems so exciting, it seems to have such a lot to offer. But all its glamour is tinsel. There's no reality to it. If you're over 25 or over 40, your problem will not be so much loving the world as loving something in the world. Like 
a special kind of car or a special kind of house or special clothes, you understand? It's just something that draws you. Uh, older people probably are a little bit disillusioned about the world, but there's still something in the world that holds on to them. It may be something intellectual. It may be reading all sorts of books which you shouldn't be reading. You shouldn't be filling your mind with a lot of garbage, but because of your intellectual background, there's still something that holds on to you. I have a principle. I try never to fill my mind with garbage. If I think anything is unhealthy for my mind, at the moment that I sense it's unhealthy, I close my mind and shut it off. I do not want to carry garbage in my mind. But a whole lot of Christians who wouldn't indulge in immorality or sensuality indulge in a lot of intellectual garbage gathering. And that's the way the world still holds on to their lives. Let's see what John goes on to say. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot love the world and God the Father at the same time. You have to choose. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. Everything in the world is not of God the Father. That's this world system. And John mentions three specific types of temptation. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. In the original temptation in the Garden of Eden, there were all three. The uh, fruit on the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was to be desired to make one wise. That's the pride of life. The pride of life is, I'm pretty clever, I can handle life on my own. I don't need God. That's all of the world. It is not of the Father. You see, if I may say so, the essence of sin originally was not the desire to do evil because the temptation was good. Be like God. No good and evil. There's nothing wrong with that. The essence of sin is the desire to be independent of God. And that's the pride of life. And as long as there's anything in us that resists depending on God, the pride of life has not been dealt with in us. And then John says, all and the world is passing away and the last of it. It's all impermanent. It's not going to last. Can you say amen to that? It's hard to believe that, isn't it? But it's true. But he who does the will of God abides forever. That's an exciting statement. If I will renounce the things of the world and align my will totally with the will of God, I am as unshakable and undefeatable and unsinkable as the will of God. There's nothing that can defeat me. Because there's nothing that can defeat the will of God. So there's the options. Stay embroiled with the world and suffer its miseries. Or turn your back on the world, align yourself with the will of God, and become unsinkable, undefeatable. Now, concerning the world, it's, it's amazing how much the Apostle John tells us about the world. That's, he's the chief writer. In 1 John 5, 19, John makes a sweeping statement. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Who is the wicked one? Satan. Now, the, the Greek is even simpler. It says the whole world lies in the wicked one. The whole world. It's under the sway of Satan. And then in Revelation 12 and verse 9, we have this picture of the many facets of Satan... And it calls him the great dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, that's the slanderer, and Satan, the resister, who deceives the whole world. The whole world is under the deception of Satan. You understand? Now in James chapter 4, verse 4, James says, Adulterers and adulteresses, 
Do you not know that the love of the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be the friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We cannot love God and the world simultaneously. John 14, Jesus said, The ruler of this world comes and has nothing in me. You see, the question is, do we have a fifth column? Does Satan have a fifth column in us? You know the origin of the word fifth column? Well, there was a war in Spain in 1936, civil war, Spaniards fighting Spaniards. And there was a certain Spanish general proceeding a Spanish city, and another general said to him, what is your plan to capture this city? And he said, I have four columns advancing on the city, from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Then he paused and said, but it's my fifth column that will take the city for me. And the other general said, where is your fifth column? And he replied, inside the city. See, the church is never defeated from without. Jesus was never defeated from without. You and I will never be defeated from without. But if there's a fifth column inside us, that's how we'll be defeated. Let me end with a little parable about the ship and the sea. Some of you have heard that before. A ship in the sea is all right. The sea in a ship is all wrong. What's the application? The world in the church, I'm sorry, the church in the world is all right. The world in the church is all wrong. What happens when the sea gets into a ship? It sinks. What happens when the world gets into the church? It sinks. The only remedy is the cross. Let me quickly recapitulate the five deliverances here in Galatians. From this present evil age, from the law, from self, from the flesh, and from the world. I like to close with the words of Paul, God forbid that I should glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified to me, and I to the world.